Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verses nine, uh, 219 and 220, which read as follows. Chirappava sing purisang dura to soti magatang nyati mita suhajaja abinandanti agatang tatheva katapunyampi asmaloka parangatang punyani patiganhanti piyang nyati va agatang which means When a person who has been gone long, gone away, far away for a long time, returns well and in good health, returns well from far away, their relatives, their friends, and even their relatives, friends, and companions, they rejoice at their coming. Just so, Tateva Katapunyampi, just so, for one who has done good deeds. Gone from this world to the next. Punyani Patiganhanti, their good deeds receive them. Just as relatives would a dear one who has returned. It's a poignant and poetic set of verses. They were taught in regards to Nandiya. Nandiya was not a monk. He was a lay person. But he was very much devoted to Buddhism. Devoted to the Buddha, the monks, and the teachings, of course. And he was kind and generous to the the monks and the Buddha and, and respectful and spent devoted a lot of his time to visiting and listening to the Buddha's teaching. You see this in in Buddhist societies, people who are uncommonly interested in the monasteries and the Sangha and the teaching and the the, the practice Even young people sometimes And it's rare But you'll see them sometimes very much interested In the religion, in the practice He was one such person And so his parents Like all parents at the time It seems Or m most parents Ordinary parents at the time What did they do? Well yes, they sought out a wife For her, for him and they found um, someone who lived next door. I think it might have been a cousin or something, actually. Was it? Yes, his uncle's daughter. Seems like marrying your cousins was a thing. Rewati. And they wanted the two of them to get married. I guess to keep the Keep it in the family, <laughs> keep the bloodline, I don't know. Well, there's some assurance, I guess, for the family, from the parents' perspective, that you're marrying someone who is of similar ideas and similar perspectives and similar backgrounds. And there are all sorts of other strange reasons people give, I suppose, like genes and blood and that sort of thing. Lineage, tradition. Culture. Culture is often a big part of it. But the thing about this was, Rewati was not at all compatible with Nandiya. And though it's rather incidental to the story, the, the text does make a bit of a deal out of the fact that Nandiya wouldn't marry her. Why? Because she had no interest in the, the monks or the, the Buddha, no interest in the teaching or the practice. She didn't seem all that generous or kind. 
and says, I don't want to marry her. But the parents, I guess, were were determined, and so they went to they went to Rewati. They didn't force him to get married, which is seems to be the case. Seems to be the way it was. We see a lot of these stories where they didn't force them to get married. Instead, they went to Rewati and said, "Look, we want you to uh, start to be a good Buddhist. Start to pay respect to the Buddha." They wouldn't have said good Buddhist because back then it wasn't about religions, but they would have said pay respect to the, the Gotama. He is the teacher of our son, and if you want to get into his good graces, you have to show that you are respectful and interested and keen on the Buddha and his teachings. So Rivati was, I guess, keen on on uh, the marriage somehow or else maybe she was coerced into it for women in the time at the time i think it was not easy if they didn't get married so for her getting married especially to someone who was wealthy like nandia was would be a very important task to accomplish in their life unfortunately i'm not promoting this this sort of culture but it was the way of things at the time so just to survive they would have to secure a good marriage. And so she did as was requested and suddenly appeared by all appearances to be a good Buddhist and so Nandia married her. It's not really actually important to the story but it, it is an interesting point that we can come back to. The point is that Nandia was a very good sort of person, kind and generous and uh, and, and very... Um, sensitive to the Dhamma. So he was interested in practicing, he was interested in listening to the Buddha's teaching. Uh, but he was also very generous, and so he would give gifts and and host the monks in his house and that sort of thing. And So he had Nandia do the same. He, he said to her, look, if you want to live in my house, you got to take part. And so she did. She was very humble and... and uh, respectful towards the monks and, and got involved, joined in with uh, offering them food and that sort of thing. Um, but Nandia, one day he had this thought to himself. He, he thought to himself, what would be something really good that I could do as a, as a good deed? And he had heard or, or he had come to consider the idea of giving uh, a dwelling. And this was his idea. And so he started making plans and he had this real strong ambition to offer a, a dwelling to the to the Sangha. And this was in um, Isipatana. So if you, those of you who were on the, or have been on a pilgrimage to India, you can remember how in Isipatana, this is where the Buddha became enlightened, so I'm not sure if this is the Buddha coming back to Isipatana or if it was when he was there in the first place. But you can remember that there are many ruins of monasteries, so of buildings. So it may be that we saw there the building that Nandia built, although most likely it was covered over by the ones we saw were only the later generations. But somewhere in there, supposedly, Nandia built a, a monastery with four rooms. Uh, he built a dwelling with four rooms, and the, the text goes on about how splendid it was, but I think more important is his great faith and his great uh, conviction about his good, his good deeds, about doing this, about doing something that he felt would be great for not just the, the Buddha Sasana and not just for the monks, but just good for him in general and good thing for him to do in general. And at that time, so he, he did this, he, he, he put together this plan and he enacted it and he built this this dwelling and he was very much caught up in the conviction and it just was such a, a wholesome great deed. And then that day, the day that he offered, he offered the, 
the, the monastery and they had this tradition of offering so the Buddha would held out his, his hand and this was not just with the Buddha this was a I've tried to find out how it was but this was apparently just a tradition in India I don't know if in India you could ask someone and they could explain it to you even today but they would take water and they would pour it over the hand of the person they were giving it to it's not just a Buddhist thing it was apparently something that people would do with each other as a means of washing their hands of it so the person giving would take water the person taking would hold out their hand something like this and they pour water at the moment when he poured water over the Buddha's hand to symbolize giving it Moggallana was up in heaven the heaven of the Tao Tingsa Moggallana was one of the Buddha's chief disciples and he had very strong inclination towards mental powers one of them which was traveling with his mind to the various realms the heavens often but also hell I think he also saw many ghosts traveling around and related those but one of his pastimes was to be in heaven and when he was up in heaven he saw this beautiful mansion made of jewels and gold and with lots of uh, lots of women it says or lots of women there it, it points out it's a story I don't know there were lots of women who attendants the idea is that there were nymphs I guess in attendance and he went in and he said and he went up to and he said oh I've never seen this uh, great mansion before it was the text says it was 12 leagues wide something like that huge just a big a real royal palace one that could only be built in heaven probably and he said he said to some of the women the the nymphs that were hanging out there he said oh this i've never seen this before whose whose mansion is this whose palace is this and they said it its owner isn't here yet. I said, well, where's its owner? Well, you see, today, just this morning, uh, Nandia, this man in Isipatana, who lives in Baranasi, offered uh, a, a, a dwelling to the Buddha. And his, his great conviction was so strong, and his gift was so pure, that this is the result. He hasn't even died yet. He hasn't even come to heaven yet. And we're all kind of disappointed that he's not here. And we want to ask you, Venerable Sir, please, when you talk to him, please tell him to hurry up. We're waiting for him here. And Moggallana was quite surprised by this. So he went to see the Buddha. And he said to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, is it true that uh, beings, who people who do good deeds Even though they haven't passed away yet the, the, the results in heaven, palaces and whatever can spring up Even though they haven't been, they haven't left They haven't, they aren't there to experience them And the Buddha said, you, you, you know for yourself, why do you ask? And then he repeated this ver these two verses as a lesson for that So uh, on the face of it, it's a fairly worldly sort of tale. It's talking about things like rebirth and heaven, which, which are limited in Buddhism. They're not the goal, of course, and they're not the main doctrine. And many people don't even believe in them. You know, in, in this audience that we have in the West, there's a skepticism about the even existence of heaven and angels, which is not a pro not a, a large problem. It's not something we should be concerned with. So. We don't have to talk about these things most of the time. But we come across a story like this, and, and there are some interesting points that we can make, even for people who are more focused on meditation. So for our meditation, in our practice, what's the significance of this story? Well, the first lesson, before we get into the real core of it, is this side story of Nandia and Rewati. The Vimana Watu apparently continues the story and talks about how Nandia went on to 
do good deeds, uh, pay respect and, and venerate the Buddha and his disciples and the teachings and so on. Didn't become enlightened, I guess, but went to heaven and, and was able to live in his palace with all the nymphs. Um, but Rewati, on the other hand, was after Nandia died, it says that she stopped giving gifts, stopped respecting the Sangha, started reviling the monks. And when she died, she went to hell. So um, it, that, that whole story gives some reminder to us. First of all, the fact that Nandia would, would um, hold as a criteria for marriage the sharing of similar religious or, or uh, spiritual inclinations. You know. Someone would have to be respectful or interested in the Buddha's teaching if I'm going to marry them. That sort of thing is often overlooked or trivialized by Buddhists and well, people in general. Sometimes we get lucky and, and that comes as a part of it, but quite often, of course, our romantic inclinations, uh, and, and not only romantic inclinations, but our connections with others are determined by far more worldly things. So obviously lust and desire, but friendships as well often are based on sometimes quite strange um, premises. The amount of time we've known someone we often think is sufficient known this person forever, we're just good friends. But the Buddha was quite particular about this and quite clear and, and specific and, and adamant about the importance of having good friends and the danger of having bad friends. We drag each other down. Bad friends will drag you down. This is why solitude is often preferable. If you can't find a good friend, someone who can help you, can support you. So Nandi, I think, was right, and I can't imagine that their marriage was as perfect as it's kind of whitewashed to be in the story. The details are left out, but Nandi, it seems, uh, Rewati, it seems, was acting on um, coercion or perhaps force being pushed into her spiritual practice and her kindness and her generosity. It says that she appeared, the text says, she seemed just like one who had faith. And we can see how that turned out for her, being pushed into it, being forced into it. So with friendships and even with romantic engagements, I, I've often, as, as a teacher, seen students talk about this, had them ask me questions about how to deal with friends, how to deal with lovers, you know, romantic interests, that sort of thing, partners. Who were, who were not interested in Buddhism. And I, I think the answer often is that you have to go your separate ways. You have to be um, you have to be determined and you have to be strong, decisive in, in, in deciding who your friends and, and companions are going to be, even relatives. This is his cousin, but it's not a cousin that I think he should have spent a lot of time, time hanging out with or certainly getting married to, because it sounds like she had different interests, which of course is fine. It's not that we, it's not that you should look down on people, of course. You should just wisely and, and you know, in a very objective sort of way, understand that the interaction with this person and the purposeful engagement with them is probably not to anyone's benefit. You drag, they just drag you down. They, they, they lead you to problematic states, problematic results. So association with good people, it's a very important, the Buddha said, eta mangala mutamang, asevana chabalanam, not to associate with fools, pandita nancha sevana. To associate with wise people. And again, it's not about looking down. It's not even about avoiding, no. But certainly, I think about not getting married to or, 
or considering to be a, a, a valuable friend or ally or compatriot, companion. The second lesson is the, the the sort of obvious lesson, and it's this lesson in in the goodness of goodness, you know, good for goodness, goodness for goodness's sake. That Buddhists are very much engaged in good deeds. Nandiya was, throughout his life, it sounds like, interested in generosity and support, and. Uh, patronage for the Buddhist um, Sangha, the Buddhist community. And, and all, it doesn't really say, but it also most likely uh, dedicated to the teachings and the practice. But all of these things, that what they have in common is what the verse talks about, is punya. They're involved with goodness. And sometimes as meditators we miss this. So how does this relate to our meditation? Well, it's kind of a checking of ourselves. For those who are of the view that the most important part of Buddhism is meditation, therefore that's what I should focus on, it often can become the case that you miss some attachment because you're not challenging yourself with the challenge of giving, with the challenge of generosity, with the challenge of of active good deeds, active kindness and humility and so on. And so as a result, you keep all the things that you own and any wealth that you accumulate and you can start to get very attached to it and you don't notice it because it's easy to be at peace. There's no uncertainty, there's no instability as long as you have wealth and power and so on. But giving Giving is very useful because of the, the its its quality of giving up, right? If it's true, truly giving, it often involves giving up something that you'd rather have for yourself. And so as a result, it challenges you. It forces you to, to confront your attachment to things and realize that there are many things that we don't need, but we just enjoy and become attached to. So giving challenges you, it forces you to see this, the greed, the attachment, and the aversion and the suffering that come from not getting what you want, you know, from withdrawal from your addictions. When you give, you confront stinginess, and you confront greed. So charity is a very good act. Mahasi Sayada said something very pointed. He said, yes, it's true that you don't need to do good deeds, but if you don't do good deeds... What are you going to do? It's most likely that you'll just end up doing bad deeds. And that's certainly the case. In the absence of good deeds, you know, all that's going to fill the void are many sorts of clinging and, and partiality and aversion and that sort of thing. The good deeds uh, put us in a, in a position, you know, supporting the Buddha, didn't just end at supporting the Buddha, it put him in a position to hear the Buddha's teaching, to be in touch with uh, the practice. And even if he didn't become enlightened, he's most certainly benefited from that association. And so it's something that we should remember, it is an important point. Of course, goodness of meditation and study and so on, listening to Dhamma is also goodness. So when the Buddha talks about punya, He's not just talking about giving gifts. In fact, often he would use that, the concept of doing the good deed of giving, as a jumping off point to talk more generally about punya, which is what he does here. He's, I think he's more generally referring not just to the generosity of giving a monastery, for example, but the goodness of, of any kind of practice, any kind of punya. And the third lesson that we should keep in mind is, I think, um, well, it's a very obvious part of the story, a glaring sort of questionable for many people part of the story. It's more of a metaphysical aspect in the sense of it talks about the nature of reality. It's deeper and it has perhaps deeper implications for the practice. And that's the aspect of how our deeds can affect 
seemingly in magical ways the world around us. So I'm certain there's a large amount of skepticism from some people in regards to the idea that there would even be a mansion in heaven for someone, let alone the fact that it would spring up spontaneously yeah, at the moment when someone does a, a good deed. Like any time we do a good deed, there's mansions popping up in heaven all over the place. I mean, first of all, it was a very sort of rare example. It's not every day that someone offers a dwelling place to the Buddha. Um, but certainly there would have been a sense that this wasn't a one-time affair. This is the sort of thing that happened any time. People did those great deeds in the time of the Buddha with such a worthy recipient. But there's in the Buddha's teaching a more general sense that not only do our good deeds affect, our good and bad deeds, affect our own minds, they by extension appear to affect the world around us. And so you have to have this idea, be open to the idea that the world around us is less independent of our experience than we think. You know, and, and we always, as you know, spiritual people are notorious for bringing up quantum physics, but there are qualities to reality that quantum physics seems to point out that shake up the idea that we're dealing with billiard balls, that we're dealing with entities that are there, that, that, that exist in space and time, independent of the observer, for example. The idea that the observing mind is a part of the reality and so reality is dependent in some respects on the observer now scientists tend to confine this sort of thing to subatomic levels but there are examples where it comes into the the superatomic the the large scale the macroscopic and Buddhism has this sense that this is the case and, and is, is most especially the case in relation to good and bad deeds, of course, because those are the ones that are going to relate to suffering and happiness because that's the whole definition of suffer of good and bad. Something is good because it relates to happiness and peace and freedom from suffering. Something is bad because it leads and encourages and involves suffering. And so, so it's something very important for us to keep in mind and to really have a sense of in terms of our understanding of what reality is. It very much ties in with the nature of our perspective as meditators. That our perspective is not of a place where we are and the, the body in, pla in space and time and even the mind as an entity. But in terms of experiences that are very much very much dependent and, and uh, tied up with, tied to our reactions, our intentions, our inclinations. So much so that it seems like the whole world is in some ways, not perhaps entirely, but in some ways dependent, equally dependent on our states of mind, our collective states of mind, if you will, and that perhaps if you were to pick apart, suddenly pick people off of the world, you'd start to see the world change in ways that we don't really have instruments that can detect this, but it very well may be and seems that if you were to erase people, if you could somehow just, if you were God, right, you could just wave a magic wand and start, start zotting people, start, you know, disappearing people, so that they just didn't exist anymore, beings, that you'd see the world start to unravel. And that's why, you know, the, the whole idea of God, of course, is, is not um, a part of this, because it, what, it, what it means or what it implies is that potentially, if all the beings were gone, there would be no reality, Right? Which, which helps you to sort of come closer to a sense of a, a mindful perspective of the world. Right? As meditators, 
you feel this the, That reality is your experiences And re experiences are extending out into the world There's a, there's a relationship uh, in Between the objects of experience and the experiencer And, and it's a very different way of looking at the world from this sort of object entity based impersonal reality based way of looking that that classical physics is you know, we're, we're all trained through popular science and popular culture to think of the world this way as being entities that exist you know people exist things exist this house this this village this country hmm. To think of them as existing you know, It's a very different perspective That you start to gain from meditation You Instead of feeling your legs Or your stomach You feel pain Or you feel tension and Instead of your body being hot You just experience the heat And you start to see that it's actually quite different That the body is just something That we conceive of The body starts to disappear Instead of seeing the stomach or seeing it as the stomach, you see it as a tension, you experience it as a tension. Uh, why this is important might not seem evident uh, right away, but the point of this and the point of the meditation practice is that our observation of reality is essential to becoming free from suffering because... The mechanics of how suffering arises and how suffering ceases are 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 um, exclusively in this process of reality. You know, suffering doesn't come from people. That person doesn't make you suffer. And if you think like that, that is why we can never become free from suffering. Because what is our way? Eliminate the person. Eliminate our relationship with them. Run away from them. It's too cold, turn up the heat. It's too hot, turn up the cold. You're hungry, eat. You're thirsty, drink. You want something, get it. You don't want something, throw it away. Right? That's how we conceive of suffering. When there's a problem, solve it. It's very different. It's a very different perspective from there are experiences and I don't understand them. Their experiences, and now I do understand them. And that understanding frees us from suffering. So the Buddhist idea is that our, our suffering comes from our lack of understanding. I mean, it, it comes directly from our reactions and our engagements with the world that are improper and, and problematic. But the only reason that we engage in such ways is because we don't realize it, we don't understand that those ways of engaging are causing us suffering. The practice of mindfulness gives us a better perspective, allows us to see more clearly what we're doing, how we're engaging, what are our emotions, what are our states of mind, and begin to change and begin to refine our habits to the point where we engage with the world, engage with experience, in a way that doesn't lead to suffering Simply by understanding By knowing, by being familiar With the mechanics of it How does reality work? Right How does reality work? It involves very much A causal Relationship Or, or a causal framework By which Our emotions, our intentions Our inclinations Affect reality not just make us a bad person But they actually change our universe You know, there's stories about our About beings Who first came in contact with the planet Earth And, and were uh, enchanted by it So much so that they begin to in, Engage in it And receive sustenance from it These were like celestial beings of some sort but by, by engaging with it and by, get, by getting excited by this physical coarse object, they became more coarse themselves and they became stuck to it. 
And because of the coarseness, the earth became more coarse as well. It, 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 it describes this sort of evolution of coarseness. Take it as you will, but it comes eventually down to things like sickness. Sickness only arising because our minds became sick, because we started to become more sick. And you, to some extent you can see this, you know, with... Um, the Buddha said meat was, the beginning of eating meat was a real instigator or, or trigger for a lot of sickness. And of course, there's no more pointed example of, uh, of that in today's society than, than in, the, in the present situation, where apparently it did come from the, the sale of wildlife and exotic animals. But... There's so many sicknesses that have come from things like meat and so much bacteria that you only find in uh, in, in blood and, and animals and you know, meat. So many sicknesses that, that come from, from coarseness, you know, from our need, you know, the whole uh, industrial revolution and, and the, the, the intensity of desire that it, it involved. It wasn't just the products like bad food, processed foods. It wasn't just them that started making us sick. They were just, a, you know, they're just concepts that are a part of this sickness of mind that was so intently fixated on pleasure as opposed to peace. And we went to war and the war, how much sickness comes from war, how much sickness comes from industry. From simply the, the living in cities, which are ultimately about maximizing our our wealth and, and pleasure in a way that you can't find living in the forest, you can't find living in the country. The sickness that sicknesses that come from all of this. And in an opposite sense, the the way a person's world changes when they begin to do good deeds, when they begin to be kind. People who do these sorts of things start to see that their world changes, their friends change. Sometimes it seems in miraculous sorts of ways. So whether you believe in that extended sort of, the, it's an interesting idea, it doesn't really matter. What's important is in general and, and uh, in its entirety for us to begin to see more clearly the causal relationship between our experiences and our, our reactions to our experiences and, and well, our reactions and our intentions and the world around us, the things we experience. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>